good to see everybody today. We're down in number a little bit, but we have a holiday weekend. This is kind of the last of the summer, and it seems like a lot of people will uh, take that opportunity to take the kind of a last minute uh, vacation because they have three or four days off, and I can understand that. But we're glad to have all the visitors this morning. And uh, we will be, as Bill said, we will be having a trustees and finance committee meeting at 5.30. It'll just be a short meeting because we're just going to kind of lay down a format and uh, have some things to think about. Turn, if you will, in your Bible to Luke the second chapter and I'll begin reading with the 41st verse. And this sermon is being about the Father's business. Being about the Father's business. Now I've never preached from this text that I remember but I'll tell you this text has been preached from a lot of times. But you be praying that the Holy Spirit will give us some light on this subject. And I know that when I started reading this, the Lord showed me some things that I'd never thought about before in this passage. And it, was a, it goes back to when Christ was 12 years old. And I will begin reading the 41st verse. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew it not. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Now, I would you like to notice that she asked him a question and he answered the question with a question. And I believe that even though he was 12 years old, I believe he was absolutely amazed that they would ask such a question. Or he certainly would have been amazed if it hadn't have been that he was the Son of God and knows all things. And I know that the question has come up and I've heard people say this over and over again. How old do you suppose Jesus was before he realized who he was? How old do you suppose Jesus was before he realized that he was indeed the Son of God? He was the Savior of the world, the, the Christ, the Anointed One. And I've heard people even say this. I've heard people say, I would like to have uh, Jesus' little Bible because I would just imagine that in his little Bible, why, he had a lot of verses underlined where he would study those and memorize those. Listen, I want to tell you something. There never was a point in history when he didn't know who he was. Even as a babe in the manger, he knew who he was. And I believe I can prove that today. Jesus said, Know ye not, I must be about my Father's business. Be asked a question, How is it that you ask such a thing? Now, now, just reading that, if you just take that one passage and you don't know anything else about the Bible, you can understand their concern for Jesus. Now, here they went up to Passover. Now, that was a, a deal. They had a, a feast. They had once a year. It was a very important time. That's when they would bring their lambs and their bullocks and so forth and so on. They would bring them up and offer them for their sins. And that was once a year. Now, after they had done this, they started home not realizing that Jesus wasn't with them. They thought, well, he's, uh, he's in the caravan. He's someplace with the rest of the family. And after they'd been gone, they finally noticed that he isn't here, so they went back to get him. And they found him in the temple. Now, notice who he was talking to. 
It said that he was talking to the lawyers and the doctors, the scribes. These were the men that had given their life to understanding scriptures. And he would ask them questions and answer them. They would ask him questions. He would answer them. And they were amazed at the wisdom of this 12-year-old boy. And so the mother and father scolded him. Son, how is it you've treated us this way? Don't you know we were worried to death about you? Why did you do this to us? And he turned and said, How is it that you worried about me? Why in the world, is what he's saying, why in the world would you be concerned about my welfare? Don't you know I must be about my father's business? All right, now why, now why would we say, now, now I know how I'd be about one of my children. You know how you'd be about one of your children. We've all had, all, all had that happen. How many has ever gone to the fair or we've gone somewhere with our family and we tell our kids now, stay together, just stay together, just don't get separated or you be right here at a certain time. They aren't, and we're naturally concerned. I know my wife is even to this day, even though our kids are grown. She's concerned if they're not home a certain time or are at a certain place when they should be at a certain place, and that's understandable. But it's without excuse in this point in time. And at this case, that is absolutely ridiculous for the parents of Jesus to be worrying about their son Jesus. And you say, well, why do you say that? Why, why would you say that it's, it, they shouldn't be worried about him? Well, because you see, in the first place, when Mary conceived, Joseph being engaged to Mary was going to put her away privately because he was a just man. But an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because she is going to give birth to the Savior who is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, now can you imagine this worrying about God's welfare? Oh, you know what? We left God back in Jerusalem, Wayne, and, and, and I sure hope nothing happens to... See, he should have known nothing could happen to that boy. Well, what about Mary? But now let me show you something. I want to show you human nature and all this. And one thing I want to show you is this, and keep this in mind. If you're not saved, you don't understand anything spiritually. You can't. The Bible says the natural man receives not the things of God. He can't understand them. They're spiritually discerned. But now keep this in mind. We that are saved also have a problem with that. We don't have the understanding that we should have. We are so limited, even though we're Christians, we're very limited about, by our understanding. Now, we know that Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, that meant he was a very educated religious man. He was a, a man that studied the law and the doctrines of the Bible. And he came to Jesus by night and said, uh, uh, Rabbi, we know you've come from God because of the miracles that you work. We know that God sent you. And so Jesus immediately began to tell him how to be saved. And he said, ye must be born again. And do you know what? Nicodemus didn't understand one thing he was saying. Why, he hadn't been converted yet. He was completely spiritually blind. And he said, how can a man that is old enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born again? He said, I don't understand. And Jesus tried to explain. He said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. And he still didn't understand. And Jesus said, listen, if you can't understand earthly things, you certainly can't understand spiritual things. So we can understand why people are lost. They can't understand until the Holy Spirit does a work on their heart and enlightens them. Until they can see their lost condition and their damned condition before holy God. See, God is the God, uh, uh, the salvation is of the Lord. And God must do the convicting. God must be the one that would bring you to himself. So we can understand that a person that isn't saved cannot understand spiritual things. But even we that are redeemed can't see things like we should. You know, I want to tell you a joke on myself. I was uh, studying for a sermon, and I found one in Corinthians, since we're studying in Corinthians. And it says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. That's all the verse says. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Well, I thought, boy, that'd make a good sermon. I believe I'll preach on that, Brother Wayne. So I got my books out, and I started running some reference. First of all, the word unspeakable in Greek, that word, particular word, only occurs one time in the whole New Testament. And it means beyond our comprehension. That means you cannot comprehend this unspeakable gift that God has given you. 
Only in eternity can we begin to understand just how precious Christ really is. Only in eternity can we even begin to understand what God has really given us. He has given us His only begotten Son. And as I was reading that and studying that, it says there's no words. That word also means that there's no words in human tongue that can describe the greatness of this gift that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. And as I was studying that, I began to laugh. And I thought, how am I going to preach on something you can't preach on? Now, if I could even comprehend how great Christ was and what a great and precious gift he is to mankind, I could make you understand it. So I thought, well, I'll be preaching a sermon that I can't even understand. I can't comprehend just what God has done for us when he gave Christ. You see, because even though we have the Spirit, we're so limited. We're so limited. If you remember when Jesus came to Lazarus, Lazarus had died. Martha said, oh, Lord, had you been here, our brother Lazarus wouldn't have died. And he said, Lazarus will rise again. She said, oh, Lord, I know that in the resurrection he'll rise again. He said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. You see, even though we're saved, we can't comprehend nor understand spiritual things as we should. Now, notice something about Mary. It was something, it's funny about Mary. Mary was always pondering things in her heart. And we do the same thing. Several places it says she was amazed or she marveled. You see, when Gabriel came to her and said, Mary, you're going to have a son and his name is going to be Jesus and he's going to be the Savior of the world and his kingdom will be without end and on, on and on and on. And it says that she would ponder these things in her heart. Why? Because she didn't have the, have the spiritual, you see, capacity to understand the full implication of what this angel was saying. And in other places, the, 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 the shepherds, after the angels appeared to them, you know, and announced the birth of the Savior, well, then they came and told Mary and Joseph, said the angels came and a chorus of angels sang and said, Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. The Savior is born into the world. And they pondered these things. Now, let me tell you something about Mary. Let me tell you something about Mary. She's the woman that brought the Savior into the world. And I know she was a good woman or God would not have chosen her to bring the Savior into the world. But friend, she wasn't deity. She wasn't deity. She's not God. She is not virgin born. There's only been one virgin born and that is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. She had a hard time understanding just like we have a hard time understanding. She was not deity. She couldn't understand all things. And even after all these prophecies had been given to her concerning the Son and that He was the Savior and that His kingdom would be without our end, she said, we're worried about you. What's happened to you, Jesus? We're worried about you. He said, no, you know, I must be about my Father's business. All right? Now, what happens to man? Let not know what happens and why would they look at that like that? The same reason we look at Scripture like we look at it. You know, when we look at Scripture, we have tunnel vision. How many has ever used a magnifying glass? That's old people have, I'll tell you that. We've used magnifying glass. Some of the young people even have. One thing about a magnifying glass, now I've got my Bible laid out, and I can see all four columns from here. But if you get a magnifying glass, it will draw that down, and you can just see a few words. And that's the way we look at things, only we've got tunnel vision. All they know is he's 12 years old, he was lost, and they worried about him. You see, but now we're, this morning, let's back up and let's look at him and see who he really was and why he said, why are you worried about me? You see, if anybody should have known who he was, they should have, because it was announced to both of them who he was. They should have known who he was. But you see, they look at him just like you would look at your child. He's 12 years old, he's our firstborn, and we love him, and so forth and so on, and we've got to take care of him, we've got to watch after him. You know, that's just the way mothers do. That's the way fathers do. We take care of our children. All right, now notice something. He said, I must be about my father's business. All right, now let's notice something about Christ and being about his father's business. In the beginning, in Genesis, it said God created the heavens and the earth. All right, do you know who did that? The same Christ that said, I must be about my father's business. He was about his father's business when he laid the foundations of the world. 
when he took dust and molded Adam, he was being about his father's business and he was doing the will of the father. And it says everything that was created was created by him. If it was made, he made it. He was about his father's business. All through the Old Testament, you can see the Christ, the anointed one, being about his father's business. He says, Abraham, get up, Abraham, and leave your kinfolks. I'm going to take you to a place. He was about his father's business. He told Abraham, look at the stars, look at the set. He was about his father's business. One other time, he came with two angels, and they came to Abraham, and Abraham killed a, a calf and, and, and prepared a meal, and they sat there, and they ate with him because what? Christ came on a mission. He was about his father's business. God sees things. He sees the broad scope of things. We just see the narrow thing. Don't you know he's looking for you? Don't you know he's worried about you? Christ has always been about his Father's business. Always has been. Do You see, when Jesus came to planet Earth, that was just another mission from the Father. He was, on, he was about his Father's business when he came and was born on planet Earth. Now, you know what? I, I can just see Mary because she's like us. I know she didn't understand who that was she held in her arms. But let me tell you who that was that she held in her arms. Now, Jesus, in his prayer, let me show you what he said in his prayer. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now, I want you just to notice something a minute. Now, we know that John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. He said over in Isaiah that he would come crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now there was a point in time when Christ, within his glorified state, told Gabriel the angel, angel, it's time to go to one Zacharias. He stands in the temple and he's offering incense and announced to him that Elizabeth, his wife, shall conceive and have a son and they're to name him John. There was a time. And the angel Gabriel came to uh, Zacharias and said, you're going to have a son, and he's going to announce the birth and the entrance of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he said, how will I know these things will happen? He said, you won't speak till after your son is born. Zacharias couldn't speak a word. Now, we know that he was a cousin to Christ. We know that, to Jesus. Now, I can just see Jesus in his glory waiting in the wings. Little John was born. Now, John was, was six months older than Jesus. And I believe Jesus in his glory was just waiting, in, or the Christ in his glory was just waiting. In the, yeah, who was this Christ? Let me tell you something about him. Moses wanted to see this Christ. And he said, Moses, you can't look on me and live. But he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. And he said, when I pass by, he said, you can just see my hinder parts. And that was Jesus in his glory. And when he passed by, he just got a glimpse through, through the fingers and saw Christ's back parts as he's walking. And when he come down off the mountain, I mean, tell you, his whole face is just shining. They couldn't even look on him for the brilliance of his face. And that God was waiting in the wings, waiting to be born. Now, what about this man in his glory? He said, I want to return to my former glory. He said, I come to do the Father's business. I want to return to my former glory. John saw him over there on the Isle of Patmos. And when he saw him in his glorified state, he said, I fell as dead at his feet as Christ in his glorified form. And I believe when John was born, Christ, the, 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 the God, the great I am, was... Can you imagine that? Now, you, I just, it's hard to comprehend. That when it was time, he said, Gabriel, go tell Mary that she shall conceive and that she will have a holy child and that he'll be the Savior of the Lord. There was time Christ went down in a seed and he became human flesh. Now, can you imagine Mary? It says she gave birth to that little child and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in the manger, not realizing who she had. <laughs> And you know, I know she was just like the rest of you mothers. Probably count these little fingers and count these little toes, be sure they're all there. And he had a cute little button nose. He didn't he cute whose eyes he's got and all that. Not really, he was the great I am. 
He was the same God that said, Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. That's who she held in her arms. The great I am, the creator of heaven and earth. He said, no, you not. I must be about my father's business. And I want to tell you, there's never been a man that worked like this man. He said, I must needs go through Samaria. And he was sitting there on a well waiting for the Samaritan woman. We remember the story how the Samaritan woman came and she was saved. And then she left and went into town to tell all the people about this man that told me everything ever I did. And the disciples came back with food and tried to get Jesus to eat. And he said, no. He said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. He says, my meat is to do the will of the Father and finish that work. He came to do the will of the Father. That's what he came to do. And Mary and us a lot of times can only see the part of Christ that has to do right here on this planet Earth. He was born in a manger and he lived, he worked miracles, he went to the cross and he died. Listen, he's still busy. Did you know that? Oh, he's busy. Listen. He come to do the work of the Father and he went to the cross. He said, my hour has come. And when he was hanging on the cross, listen, I want to tell you something. He loved his mother. He loved his mother. He loved Mary for bringing into the world. But he had everything in the right perspective. He said, John, behold your mother. And he said, mother, behold your son. Now, isn't it amazing? He turned his mother over to John and John, she lived in John's home until she died. Now, isn't it amazing? And I've always wondered this. I'd be reading in the Bible and I'd read something. I thought, well, that doesn't seem very important. I wonder why God put that in there. Have you ever done that? You'd read something and you'd think, well, that does, I just wonder why God put that in there because it seems kind of trivial. I want to tell you something. Everything that you will read in this Bible, God thought was very important. Every bit of it. Did you know something? I believe Joseph was a great man. I do not believe that Joseph would be chosen to be Christ's stepfather if he had not been a very good and godly man. But it doesn't say anything about his death. It doesn't say when he died. It doesn't say anything. Now listen, when Mary was turned over to John, it doesn't say when she died. It didn't say anything about it. Why? Because God sees things in light of eternity. He said, I've got a job to do. And when he went away, he's still working. You know what he's doing? He's calling preachers and he's calling teachers. He's called evangelists. He's calling workers to build up the body of Christ. He's still not through. He's the messenger of the new covenant. Do you know what he's doing every time you pray? He goes before the Father and pleads your case. He's busy. He's doing the work of the Father. And one of these days he said, I'm coming again. I'm going to do the will of the Father. He said, the day is going to come when the angels, uh, when, when the trumpet's going to sound and I'm going to come with a shout and I'm going to take the church out of the world. He's doing the will of the Father. He's doing the will of the Father. He's still doing the will of the Father right this hour. Just this morning, he was doing the work of the Father. Before Sunday school started, there's a little girl, 10 years old, came up to me. said, Jerry, I want to be saved. We went into the classroom back there, and the Lord was doing the work of the Father, and he redeemed that little girl. Save that soul. He's still doing the work of the Father. And listen, right now this morning, he's doing the work of the Father. That's what he's doing. He's seeking to save that which is lost. That's what he's doing. Oh, I'll tell you what. Sure, there was a time in history when he had on the form of human flesh when he was just 12 years old. But he was always God from eternity to eternity. And he was just on a mission. You see, he had to come down here and pay your sin debt. And he didn't have time to waste time. And I believe he said to his mother and father, if anybody should understand what I'm doing here, you should understand. Because it was announced to you and announced to you and it was prophesied to you that I'd be the Savior of the world. Why do you mean you was worried about me? Know ye not I must be about my father's business? And John said this, he said, if all the things that Christ had done had been written in the books, he said, I don't suppose the world could contain the books of the things that this Christ man did, this God man. But he's still busy, and he's still going to be busy until everything is finished up. He's still doing the work of the Father. He always has been from the beginning of eternity. 
and he will be till everything is finished up and all enemies are put under his footstool. Listen, he's going to be work, doing the work of the Father at the great white throne of judgment when all of the law stand before him and he judges them out of those things written in the book. But I'll tell you what, you won't see him as a 12-year-old boy. You'll see him in all of his glory. You'll see him as John saw him when he fell dead at his feet. You'll see him in his resurrection power. He said, I've come to do the work of the Father. And right now, he has sent the Holy Spirit to deal with your hearts. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if the Holy Spirit is dealing with you right now, it's because he's still doing the work that God sent him to do. Now let me tell you something. He's going to do everything he can do. That's right. He'll do everything he can do. He was willing to leave the thrones of glory and come down here and be born in obscurity. To be born in a, in a manger where the animals live. He was willing to live here and suffer and go to a cross and die. He's willing right now to be your advocate and plead your case before the Father. And He's done all these things so that you might have eternal life. But I'll tell you what, there's one thing you do. And that's accept Him as your Savior. When He hung on the cross, when He died, He said, It is finished. You know what that meant? Your redemption was, put, was made. He paid the full price. He had paid for every one of your sins. But it's up to you to accept it. He said, I come to do the will of the Father. Now, I, what I'm trying to do right now is the will of the Father. He sent me to preach to you. I'll tell you, there's no way I'd be up here preaching to you if he hadn't sent me. Boy, it wasn't my idea. I was scared to death to get up in front of people. But he sent me to preach to you. He did the will of the Father by sending me. But friend, listen, let me tell you something. If you reject him as your Savior, he'll still be doing the will of the Father when he condemns you to a devil's hell. If you will not accept him as your Savior, you will experience him as your judge. He will either be your Savior or he will be your judge. But whatever he is, he's doing the will of the Father. Let's stand. Brother Bill, will you come? I don't know everybody's condition. I don't really know anybody's condition. Only you know how you stand between you and God. You Only you know that. If God is dealing with you right now, won't you come? As we sing, if, if the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart, that's because God is doing the will of the Father. During this dispensation, it's the will of the Father that the Holy Spirit deal with you and call you out of this kingdom of darkness into His marvelous light. Don't say no. If He's dealing with your heart, won't you come? Won't you come as we sing?